Jalen, Rachel, uh, to say the very least, there have been some considerable shifts in the United States political landscape here as of late. Uh, the Democrat Party finally grew weary of propping up Joe Biden's rotting carcass. And now uh, Vice President Kamala Harris is the party's nominee for president. And this has injected some much needed enthusiasm in uh, to the party's campaign. And Harris was even able to raise uh, a record ninety four million dollars for the DNC. And what's been obvious from the very beginning is uh, Harris angling and messaging towards young black voters specifically. Uh, she seems to have taken on this uh, cultural affect that you know, doesn't always seem completely genuine. Uh, you know, she brought up Meg the Stallion and uh, Quavo from the Migos to perform at her rallies and things like this. But what we don't see and what we haven't heard is an explicit uh, discussion or platform points that concerns the material issues that face uh, young black voters. I mean, at this point, the campaign seems mostly based on vibes and literally not being named Donald J. Trump. That's right. about all they're offering at right. this point. I mean, yeah, they're, they've been discussing platform points, but uh, more or less that that's all we have. And even recently on CNN, they had a round table with some uh, young black voters that were, you know, talking about how they were considering uh, voting for alternative parties because the Democrats are just not really speaking to their interests. And so, uh, Jalen, I want to start with you just to ask what do you think is at the root of this disaffection that young black voters are feeling more and more with uh, the Democrat Party? And where is that disconnect happening? And what do you think are sort of the real concerns that young black voters are having these days? Yeah, yeah. I, I think you you really you really point directly at the core of it. Right. This disillusionment that is easily readable from the Kamala Harris campaign, from the Democratic Party, their dissonance um, about, of course, the ongoing genocide in Palestine and about at-home issues with what it means to survive. Right. Um, um, as, as young people looking to um, come out of school even and get jobs or find work, it is extremely difficult right now. And I think that when you have figureheads of the Democratic Party uh, doing this sort of posturing, like you said, this angling and this um, this sort of propping up of things that they believe young people like, such as hip hop music or culture or, um, I don't know, memes or jokes, mm -hmm. it, it infantilizes who we are. It infantilizes right. our politics. It infantilizes um, what we believe in and our futures for that matter. So being young in this moment and being conscious of what's happening um, internationally, nationally, domestically, and desiring for effective policies for um, actual people who represent us from our communities uh, to you know the larger democratic uh, status quo. I won't even call it the party, right? The democratic status quo is, it, it, I mean, it, it's, it's really sad because it's treating us as if we don't know what's going on. And that's genuinely the point that the Democratic Party does to the working class masses across the country. Um, it's this belief that we don't know what actually is good for us. And I find that uh, not only offensive, but I find it to be something that uh, I, I personally believe that I have to stand up against because I know what I want. I know what I need and I know what people around me need. And I think that uh, from what we're struggling with from the rise of food to the cost of housing, just basic human rights and needs just aren't being met and they aren't being respected when the people in the political and ruling classes are playing in our faith. Like there's no other way to put it. Like I, I have to be colloquial about it because like you're playing in my face and I don't, I don't respect that. And I don't, I don't want to vote for you. If you think that I don't have capacity to understand or to dictate what it means to take control over my life or the lives of the people around me who I care about, mm -hmm. then you, you playing with the wrong one. I think that that's really, really the the real the real root of it, honestly. Right. I mean, I think it's like a whole tone deafness that is happening here because we've been in uprising. I mean, thinking back to 2020, that was a a moment where so many young people's fundamental consciousness about 
society and the society we live in and the things that need to change came to the forefront, right? Mm -hmm. People were like, okay, it's not just the police, it's the whole system that we need to abandon. And since then, I mean, we have obviously are in a, a mass movement still 10 months later um, against a genocide happening in Palestine and people's consciousness only continues to expand, right? And, and look for a future that's completely different than anything that the system claims to be able to offer us. And, you know, Joe Biden, when he was running, his whole slogan was nothing will fundamentally change. Right. And I think we can completely guarantee that the same thing is going to happen if Kamala Harris is to win the presidency. Because as was mentioned, she hasn't put out a single program. She's focusing more on making a TikTok or like Kamala is a brat or whatever little meme thing that she wants to do. Um, and meanwhile, people are straight up struggling. Like, I think it's easy as young people to joke about it. Like, haha, you know, like we were talking earlier, I can't even afford groceries right now, you know? And it's like, that's just something that's like, haha, that's what it is. But this is a serious issue, you know, that we're going through. I mean, I saw this clip the other day of, um, it was getting a uh, black voters response in, in Philadelphia, just like talking about the elections in general. And this woman was up there crying, talking about it's either feed my kids and I don't eat because inflation has made the cost of things so high. I mean, like we're fighting against a genocide in Palestine and the genocide that happens in our communities every day. Right. Mm. Because the U.S. continues to fun funnel billions of dollars into the war machine. Meanwhile, I'm getting emails talking about your student loan payments are overdue. Talk about tone deafness. Where y'all think I'm getting the money to pay these student loans for? It's not happening, you know, because there, there hasn't been any relief from this system. And I think young people, especially young black people are seeing that this is the reality and we need something completely different that neither the Democrats, obviously not the Republicans, can provide for us. And it's it's kind of just a joke. They're playing in our face, as Jalen said. Yeah, yeah you know, uh, I saw that NBC piece, too. And that same woman, she said that, you know, she she blames the federal government for these conditions. And she said they're killing us. Mm -hmm. Those are the words that she used. And also, when, when you talked about uh, young people not being able to afford groceries, that reminds me of this study that was done at Purdue University back in 2022 that found that one in three Gen Z adults, people born between 1996 and 2004, one in three of them, uh, in the first part of that year, they were food insecure. They could not afford food. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this had to do with the economic fallout uh, of the onset of the coronavirus, COVID-19, right. which was horribly mismanaged by this country. And some of the people hardest hit by the unemployment issue was uh, Gen Z adults. And uh, while well, at the same time, Oxfam found that there were 573 new billionaires that came out of uh, the pandemic or one every 30 hours. Now you take that every with the fact, hours. every 30, one every 30 hours. Now you take that with the fact that the uh, federal minimum wage has not risen since 2009. That's 15 years ago. That means that the older Gen Z adults were small children Mm -hmm. when uh, the wage was last risen and they're still expected to to live on this. Mm -hmm. But see, these are things that we're not hearing from uh, Kamala Harris or Tim Waltz. And certainly we don't expect to hear about it from, you know, Trump and the Republicans. They don't even pretend to be decent. You know what I mean? Right. And so you, you raise this issue, this thing that uh, Joe Biden uh, said, I believe it was to a group of donors, that nothing will fundamentally change. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the truth of what the Harris campaign represents. The campaign is being presented as a uh, progressive alternative to uh, Donald Trump and the Republicans, but the substance is, is simply not there. And I'd actually like to, to dig in a little bit more about this issue of uh, the, the Democrat stance on uh, Israel, because uh, Kamala Harris has said herself that she has unwavering commitment. Those are the words she used, unwavering commitment to Israel and its, you know, quote unquote, security. And she's also explicitly talked about Israel's right to exist. Now, if you ask me, no settler state has a right to exist. Mm -hmm. Not a single one of them. Right. Right. But it's being presented as though Kamala is to the left of Biden 
on Palestine, when in reality, she's in lockstep. The only thing that really separates Kamala Harris from Joe Biden on Palestine is that uh, Kamala says the word ceasefire mm. more than Biden. But that's about it. And we're supposed to believe that that means that she's for it. But if she was for a real ceasefire, then she would say it, mm -hmm. just like she said that she has unwavering support. But but how do you see it, Jalen? Yeah. Well, I think that she's presented, of course, on the issue of Palestine as, as more left than Joe Biden. But she's presented... And I have to add to it. She's presented as more progressive simply because of her identity. Right. That's right. That's right. I think that's the one thing that we have to like really, really hammer in is that the simple fact that Kamala Harris is the first black and first South Asian vice president of the United States in of itself is an emblematic role that she has. And this emblematic role allows for her to appear, um, appear as someone who is softer than Joe Biden. And you're right, like his rotten corpse is his dementia almost, right? Being like pulled around. There's so many memes about him like being swung into um, conferences like a like a scarecrow. And it's like she's, you know, she's younger than Joe Biden and she's black. And so that- And a woman. And a woman, exactly. So this idea of her identity being conflated with her politics is something that we have to have um, like incredible analysis about. We have to be really, really sure of that. And I think that um, that lends itself really, really well to then what she says, right? She can manipulate and say things differently because it's a it's a face that um, the ruling class and political party believes can um, deliver things in a better way than Joe Biden can or a, a Donald Trump, right? Because she's more relatable by identity sake. And I think that this allows for something like the issue in Palestine to be watered down and to be conflated and manipulated to the public. Um, my name is Kamala Harris, and I and I actually do want a ceasefire. And I think that Israel has the right to defend it itself. It's inherently a contradiction. Right. When we're when we're talking about what the settler state um, of Israel and the Zionist entity and the Israeli apartheid regime does in occupied Palestine and has been doing for the last ten months, it is abominable. It is disgusting. There, There is no other words that we can say to capture these people's attention when they're like feeding us fodder. Like there's, mm -hmm. you don't want a ceasefire. You want for people to stop interrupting your um, campaign route. You want mm -hmm. people not right. to be protesting outside of the DNC. You want people to go home and to pretend like nothing is going on. And that is the status quo and the American heritage, right? They want us to inherit this idea um, that they've manipulated in history and manufactured out of history that everything is all right. America is the safe haven of democracy um, and that Donald Trump or the Republicans are trying to uh, take the safe haven, take the democracy that we have and we hold so dear to our hearts and take it so far into the method of fascism and to be authoritarian. And I think that uh, we're already there. It's, it's happening under the rule of the Democratic Party and it has happened. We continue to see this facilitation by like our political party, uh, the Democrat, not our political party, um, but the Democratic political party let is letting it happen, is facilitating it. And I think that um, we also have to say it is facilitating through the, just just this week, twenty billion dollars to Israel is facilitating this this genocide. We've heard Benjamin Netanyahu, we've heard Gallant, we've heard the heads of state in Israel say that they could not deal out the horrible damage that has happened to the Gaza Strip without the aid from the United States. I don't know how many times we had to say it. Right, it's clear. Like I think that they know that this is happening and they're trying the best to micromanage possibly those people in our country who maybe believe it's none of their business, that, that don't understand that uh, the politics of the situation is situated in U.S. imperialism. Um, and so I really think that that's where we stand to like, to like agitate, uh, yeah. is to let people know that this is our problem. This is what we have to stand up for because it is our government facilitating it for the sake of imperialism and for the sake of profit. Yeah. Like that's the that's the part that's really crazy. 
I just want to say I do not and cannot relate to someone who is wearing hundred thousand dollar suits <laughs> and half million dollar necklaces right. or whatever. That is never someone who I or the vast majority of people are going to be able to relate to. It doesn't right? look good either. It doesn't look good. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah. I think I think as Black people as well, it's really important to not distance ourselves from the issue of what's happening abroad, whether it's in Palestine or somewhere else. Because going back to what I said earlier, it's like all the things that we don't have are because money is being spelt, spent elsewhere, exactly. right? Like the money that we don't have uh, for social security or for health care or for education or whatever it might be to actually invest in our communities and ensure that our schools and our public transportation and our housing are all good doesn't exist because it's going to the U.S. war machine to mm -hmm. reap the profits that the, U that the people in power in the United States can gather all around the world. I think people have people have kind of been against the whole train of not voting for Kamala because they're saying that we're single issue voters or something like right. that because we're only looking at this one thing, the genocide in Palestine. We have to talk about genocide. Why is genocide a single issue? Since right. when has genocide been a single issue? It's an all encompassing issue that reaches into every facet of our lives. The fact that people are dying on our behalf, technically, I mean, it's our tax dollars. Right. And they're acting, the people in power in the United States are acting like they're acting on behalf of us and our security or our beliefs or whatever it might be. And that's not the case at all. What we know and believe we need is the basic basic access to the things that we need to survive. That's what we know here. And the government loves to do everything but give us that and claim that they're fighting for democracy or peace or whatever it might mm -hmm. be everywhere else around the world. Another thing is that people like to distance Kamala from the actions of Joe Biden because she's right. VP. Right. And it's like, so <laughs> make it make sense because now that Tim Waltz is the VP nominee for Kamala, people are like, oh, he's such a progressive guy. Like, this is going to be a great administration. Like, the two of them as a duo, right. people are, are talking about them as a duo, right, is going to change things. So, so, so what is it? So... Biden and Harris aren't a duo. They're not acting together hand in hand in the genocide in Palestine and, and all the other actions, all the flops that have happened in the United States over the last four years. Like, make it make sense, people. What What is it? And I think we need to, we need to stop defending these people who don't defend us. You know, like, yeah. why are we standing on business to defend Kamala Harris in her $100,000 suit to say, oh, but she had nothing to do with it? She had nothing to do with anything good for any of us either. So what? what is it? Right. Yeah. It, it's this strange thing of treating Kamala just like a babe in the woods and like she's somehow completely separate or in her own orbit and uh, has no power to achieve anything. But she's been very clear that she's going to be on precisely the same track as Biden on Israel and other issues. And see, the propaganda is so aggressive. And so incessant that people do not know the material connection about uh, the plight of black America and Palestine. Rachel mentioned the three point eight billion dollars a year mm -hmm. in our tax dollars that go to carry out genocide against the people that did nothing to us. Right. And they don't ask us for it. They just take it. Mm. So that's money that we don't get. That's going to someone else's destruction, not to mention the fact that we know American police train with Israeli troops. Right. So the brutal and deadly tactics that these apartheid troops use against Palestinians, they teach that to American police, mm -hmm. and then they come back and use it on us right here. Right. So if you say that you care about ending police terror, then you must care about ending uh, the stranglehold that apartheid Israel has on Palestine, ending the genocide that is a happening there. And along with that, the imperialist system that gives a, a base to it all. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I actually thought of, a, I think, a good example of this idea of Kamala, how her identity is used to deflect from what is a right wing program. I know you all mm -hmm. saw this. Mm -hmm. She was at a, a rally and she said, Donald Trump talks a big game about securing our border. 
but he doesn't walk the walk. Or as my friend Quavo says, he doesn't walk it like he talks it. And the crowd goes wild. I'm like, hold up. She literally just said that she intends to outdo Donald Trump on militarizing the border. Donald Trump, who rolled to the White House on a wave of explicit racist anti-immigrant xenophobia. But since it's coming from the genocide, auntie, it's cool. Right. I I mean, what's next? She's going to say, oh, hey, this Donald Trump really thinks he's bad and bougie. Am I right, kids? It's just like, yo, you, it, 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 this whole thing just feels so put on. And what we have to realize is there's nothing magical, no pun intended. There's nothing magical about Kamala's blackness or her womanhood that is going to make her class interests the same as the class interests of uh, poor and working people in this country, black people in general, or around the world. And history shows this conclusively. We can go down the list. Barack Obama, black man, mm-hmm. uh, uh, invaded Libya. Libya was the most uh, prosperous country on the African continent. It's been plunged into a failed state with open air slave markets. Muammar Gaddafi lynched in the street. This is under a black president. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, bailed out the banks, even though he did not have to. This is something that devastated black wealth in this country. Mm. Everybody's talking about, oh, we got to build generational wealth, but we got to talk about the wealth destroyer. Mm. Colin Powell, mm. black man, <laughs> helped lie us into the Iraq war. Condoleezza Rice, black woman, also helped lie us into the Iraq war. Susan Rice, black woman, was the co-architect of Obama's Uh, invasion of Libya. Also ran point on a genocide in Congo that was perpetrated by the U.S. and the U.K. Mm -hmm. Linda Thomas Greenfield, black woman, U.S. ambassador to the U.N., the voice of U.S. imperialism on the world stage. Mm -hmm. Lloyd Austin, black man, head of the Pentagon. He's the finger on the trigger of the U.S. global war machine. Mm -hmm. So if you are in service to empire, it does not matter your race, your gender, your sexual orientation, or anything else. If you're in service to empire, you are in service to white supremacy. Mm -hmm. And as such, your interest could never be that of the masses of black people in this country or poor working and oppressed people in general. But this is the trick bag that they put us in because, you know, we're supposed to be uh, caught up in the haze of her being this, this black woman. You know what I mean? And so this, I think, raises the point about sort of the actual policies of, uh, uh, or at least what we know of them, of uh, uh, Kamala Harris and what the Democrats have been putting forth since uh, Biden has been in office. And Rachel, I'm curious your thoughts about it because, again, we're being shown something that is supposedly supposed to be a 180, when in reality it it seems to just sort of be standing in place. Right. I mean— We just have to look at the history. That's all we need to do. Look at the Mm -hmm. history of Kamala's actions and her rise to political power. And we see it right in between the lines, right in front of us, you know? History of criminalization of Black people, especially for using marijuana. We have the truancy bills that, you know, have quite literally criminalized uh, Black mothers because their children miss school. That's crazy. Like, th- like imagine, just think about a mother going to jail because her kid missed school. We have to talk about the fact that there's so many factors that go into and relate to children's education and whether they can succeed or whatever, quote unquote, in school. We have to talk about housing conditions. We have to talk about uh, the, the job and, and working conditions of the parents. Like there's so many factors and to just say, oh, you missed school, we're going to send your parent to jail because it's their fault. That's disgusting. That's absolutely disgusting. Mm -hmm. Um, We have to talk about the fact that Kamala is no friend to women either because as much as they want to put it on Donald Trump, that abortion was overturned, Mm -hmm. Roe was overturned under the Democratic presidency of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Like, it's as simple as that. That's what happened. Even, even... Even if we were to entertain the argument that's like, well, Trump put these right wing judges Mm -hmm. in this in the Supreme Court. At the end of the day, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris didn't do shit 
when it was overturned. There were so many emergency actions that they could have taken to, to, to protect the right to abortion and they did nothing. And so how can we sit up here and act like, oh, well, maybe she'll do something good for us uh, if she's to become president when this is her track record. Her track record has not shown us otherwise. And I think we need to stop scraping for crumbs. Right, like, right. like how much more clear can we be that we deserve so much more than what they're giving us. And they're literally playing in our face and offering us piecemeal solution here, piecemeal solution there. Meanwhile, I know y'all know that meme that's like the hood under Trump, the hood under Biden, yeah. right. the hood under Obama, the hood under Kamala. It's all going to look the same because at the end of the day, they're not doing anything to invest in working class and black and poor communities. You know, like think of, I mean, looking back at Obama, yeah, he was the first black president. And what did he do for black people in particular? Nothing, you know, right. like everything still looks the same. And I think we can imagine and expect the exact same to come from Kamala if she is to be elected as president. Mm -hmm. Jalen, your thoughts? I mean, you said it, like, <laughs> like speak about it, because I think that uh, thinking about what happened under these presidencies, if we, if we think about Obama, Biden, Kamala, you're you're right to to say the codification of of, of Roe could have been something that happened. Obama's explicitly said he kind of he kind of said he didn't want to do it. I remember this. Yeah. Um, Biden, you know, for the first four years, and then where where he is now, I don't even know where his, his mental capacity or faculties are. So I, I don't even know what to say about that anymore. But you're right. There's so many different things that could have happened for families. Um, working class families, for black families, all the people that they they sort of pander to with their their like empty promises, right? Mm -hmm. um, they could have did, and we talk about this a lot, they could have did Build Back Better. They could have, and they didn't. Um, two Democrats from Arizona and West Virginia, West Virginia were the cause of that, that not happening. So we could have had family um, and medical paid leave That'd for working nice. class families, even middle class families. That didn't happen. Right. So I think that all of these points that, that you're eliciting are really, really important because these is these are the things that they sort of dangle over people's heads. Mm -hmm. um, here are the things that I promise to do for you. Here are the things that I promise to do for you. I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. I'll give it to you. And again, it's this continuously this continuous infantilizing. Right. Yeah. Um, it's interesting also to the point earlier of, of Kamala being painted as innocent. Right. Because when you paint someone who is going to be in power as innocent, then it makes it seem as though they can't do any wrong. And if they do any wrong, then it wasn't really their fault. Right. right. Oh, no, they didn't. So they did, fault they didn't isn't. know any better. Right. And I think that this places this conundrum on people who, you know, care about their lives, who care about politics and want to be involved and are saying, like, I don't know where to vote. Or I don't know if I should vote for Kamala and it makes sense because maybe, you know, maybe people do identify with her. That's fine. Maybe people do see, you know what, she does look like my auntie, right? These are things that people really, really might feel, but they're divorcing the fact of what she has done to plunder communities in California. She, they're mm -hmm. neglecting the fact of what she's doing right now in regards to the genocide in Palestine. They're neglecting the entire facet of the system. And this is the difference. I think that we need a, a upholding of the entire system. There's no other way to think about it. The capitalist um, economy and the capitalist class are seeking this profit, mm -hmm. right? She's wearing these suits. She's walking and talking with these people. She's accepting this 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 pack money, right? Yeah. Because it makes her richer, right? The meme is really important too, right? Because the hood in a lot of different places where I come from, where some of us come from, has looked the same since 2001 has looked the same since the 90s, has looked the same since the 80s. There right. may be small qualitative shifts. Of course, it's important to notarize and say, okay, this is what happened for good in, in these eras, right? There are a lot of things that have changed, right? But I think that when we're talking about complete um, qualitative social growth for what it means for black people in this country, there, there isn't enough. And it needs to be because they're touting and, and parading us around as a, as a monolith that um, that they want to make these changes for us. You're right to say that anyone who serves empire um, is not going to serve the people. I think what we also have to go explicitly beyond to say is that anybody that serves empire is an enemy to me. That's mm. right. 
That's right. You're an enemy to me. That's right. Like, you're not my friend. I don't shake hands with you. Right. I won't share a room with you. I know what you care for. I know the greed that you have. I know that you will trample other people. Right. Walk over them, in fact. Crush them, in fact. Make it so that they are killing us, to quote the woman on MS, MSNBC, right? She said they are killing us without saying that they are killing us. Right. That's so, it's, it's like almost, uh, it's unfortunate how exquisite of a turn of phrase that is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. They are killing us without saying that they are killing us because they know what their actions entail. For sure. But if you were to say, I'm killing you, I'm killing you, I'm killing you, the people might rise up. Right. Yeah. The people might say, well, you can't kill me. There's more of us than there are of you. And I think that's really, really important to put, put as a basis because no one wants to enact violence. But we want for our lives to be in our control. We want for the things around us to be um, good for us. We want to eat good, live good, and survive and care about each other. Mm -hmm. right. I think these are fundamental tenets to what it means to live together and want to create a world that goes beyond the destructive war economy, that goes beyond um, just the the ravaging of capitalism and imperialism and this deformity that the Democrats keep coming coming up and talking about as it regards Donald Trump. Fascism, Walter Rodney talks about it. Fascism is a deformity of imperialism and capitalism, That's right. right? This deformity comes out of it because it's meant to be, it's built in. It's, a, it's an appendage, right? Mm -hmm. Imperialism is the desire for one world system, right? It's a desire that everything will be under control of the empire, the dollar, um, English. Um, called, like from culture to how we exchange economically and politically has to be the same because the U.S. and the West has to be in control. And I think that when you equate what uh, external or international politics look like to domestic politics is like the ruling class wants to be in control. Absolutely. The politicians want to be in control because then they dictate what that flow of profit looks like. They dictate what it means to be my enemy. I know what it looks like. Yeah. And I think that we really have to be explicit about it. We really have to say, you know, these people don't want to do things for me and my vote for anyone else is not a waste. This is this is me not only registering discontent, it is when I'm saying I'm not voting for you. But I know what else I have to do is I have to actually organize my community. That's right. Mm -hmm. I have to organize my hood. I have to tell the people maybe things that I might have learned and, and say, well, what do you think about this? Because I respect the opinions of the people who are who come from my hood, who come from my neighborhood, who come from my community, because I know that they want better lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that's just the basis of it. It's just like, we want better lives. And I don't think that anybody is going to sit around and wait for that anymore. Mm -hmm. we're, we're at a time where, again, this consciousness is raising because no one wants to wait around for empty promises. We've seen it. Mm -hmm. And especially from the Democratic Party. This is since 2008 when we're thinking about Obama, right? This is his legacy. Right, for sure. Obama, for sure. Biden as his VP. <laughs> Biden, Harris as his VP. Harris, Tim Walls. Tim, Wall Tim Walls might run. We had to also consider what Tim Walls did in Minnesota right. in 2020 That's right. with Donald Trump. That's right. And, and you know what? When you, when you talk about this, how the ruling class has this control and how they demand our participation in support of them without giving anything to us, I think this is mm -hmm. what contributes to this feeling of powerlessness yeah. amongst uh, uh, so many young people. And what you mentioned about organizing and organizing the community is uh, going to be so important to fight against what feels like an encroaching kind of hopelessness. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about hope, when we talk about this revolutionary optimism, we have to be clear that we're not talking about, you know, uh, empty platitudes or saccharine sentimentality. We have to say that the hope is is the movement. Mm -hmm. Right. The movement is the material thing that you can put in their hand and say, this is the substance of things hoped for. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because here it is. Uh, we've been uh, calling for justice for Sonia Massey, right. the mm -hmm. victim of a uh, racist police killing. There was a rebellion against racism all throughout the streets in this country mm -hmm. in 2020 uh, following uh, the police killing of George Floyd. And now you're asking us that we have to vote for someone who called herself the top cop. Uh, in order to 
uh, address our needs. Reportedly, 1,900 marijuana convictions that uh, she oversaw. And uh, also, I think we have to talk about cases like uh, Kevin Cooper, mm -hmm. uh, who was a death row inmate, right. uh, whose wrongful conviction her office upheld. And they only backed off after they started getting bad press. And uh, I think there's a connection between this issue of racist policing and uh, the, the militarization of the border that we were talking about earlier. I mean, Kamala Harris went and stood with the right wing president of Guatemala, Alejandro Giamatti, and told migrants, don't come. Mm. The Biden administration is the same administration that was trying to rapidly deport thousands of Haitian immigrants. I mean, we saw the images of uh, uh, the, the Border Patrol officers on horses. I mean, it looked like a, a scene out of Roots or something. You see what I mean? But we're supposed to believe that this party and this ticket is going to somehow uh, represent something progressive for us. You see what I mean? And, and Rachel, I'm curious how you feel about how political struggle sort of factors into this and the fact that we are in a movement moment and that we do see this kind of coming together of the black liberation struggle, the Palestinian liberation struggle, something that we can trace at least as far back as 1964 when Malcolm X wrote on Zionist logic for the Egypt Gazette. And that really got reinvigorated in 2014 during the onset of the Black Lives Matter movement, when that relationship was uh, strengthened once again. And I don't think it's a coincidence that we're seeing this effort right now to try to divide black people from Palestinians. Now, it seems like it's mostly online, but in all of this fervor over Kamala, there seems to be an attempt to try to separate young black people from these movements that they've been at the forefront of. Mm -hmm. So how do you see it? The thing that I think we need to remember is that these people in the Democratic Party are in power right now. Mm -hmm. To the point that you made earlier, Jalen, that they continue to dangle things in front of us, like Kamala is putting out, I mean, she, she's yet to put out her program, but she's talking about, oh, in nine, 10 months, I will launch an investigation to potentially ban proudly <laughs> price gouging from these corporations. And it's like, girl, you are literally in the White House right now. As we speak. Like, who y'all are talking. Like, you're not the people who are making the decisions right now. And I think we need to kick ourselves out of this cycle because this same cycle happens every four years, every election cycle. And we're like, ooh, this, is a, this seems like a good idea. Ooh, it's not Donald Trump. It's in contrast to whatever right wing, you know, the rise of the far right that's happening. But they don't have a program at the end of the day. And the fact is, why would we think we're going to have more leverage then in 10 months from now when the election is over and she's already in office than we do right now, you know? And I also I want to address the the lesser of two evils argument a little right. bit and kind of go into this this discussion on the movement that you're that you're talking mm -hmm. about Sean I completely understand it makes it, it makes sense why people would be fearful of another 4 years of Donald Trump I mean he is a disgusting racist xenophobic businessman who clearly he's he's wearing like $500,000 suits <laughs> Um, but I think we need to, we need to stop selling ourselves short. You know, we can't just sit up here and say, well, Kamala might not be perfect, but she's not Trump. And it's like, when are we going to kick ourselves out of this cycle? And at the end of the day, that comes down to organizing, right? Like right. if you, I mean, just to be blunt, if you weren't out there in, uh, when was Donald, 2016 mm -hmm. through 2020, when Donald Trump was president organizing against that, then honestly, I don't think you have any any weight in the conversation about the lesser of two evils. If you haven't been organizing under Biden, then what? how are we going to get ourselves out of this cycle, right? Like we're just going to continue to give and take the scraps that are offered to us and choose the so-called one that's so-called better. I don't know how we choose between the better of a top cop and who's also racist and xenophobic, whatever, 
and Donald Trump, yeah. who's also a racist and xenophobic. Like, how do we how do we decipher because of their identities? Mm -hmm. No, we have to see that, you know, we don't always need to be pitted against each other and battle for scraps. And I think that comes into the conversation when we're talking about black liberation and Palestinian liberation. The whole structure of our society is built on the foundation of us being divided. I mean, right. even amongst the black community, we're so divided, let That's alone right. the black community and other other you know groups of people. We're told that, oh, the reason that your housing, oh, what was the, there was something recently, uh, Donald Trump's uh, VP was saying that there's a housing crisis because of immigrants. And it's like that, there's a housing crisis because the U.S. government refuses to do anything for our housing needs, you know? But it's it leads people to believe that, oh, immigrants are, are our enemy mm -hmm. or Palestinian people are our enemy because no one's talking about what's happening to black people, but everyone's talking about Palestine. It's like, why are we in an Olympics here? Right. We're all struggling and we need we need to see ourselves as like you know combatants of each other's struggle otherwise we're going to continue to get kicked and thrown in the trash and meanwhile these people who are in power are just literally sitting there laughing at us you know yeah and th this is the diabolical genius of the divide and conquer tactics of the ruling class when you have uh, a poor and working people in this country who thinks that an immigrant who risked their life, mm -hmm. who I'm sure would have very much have preferred to stay in their home country, right. uh, uh, is is uh, having a job at a lower wage because the bosses know that their situation is far more precarious. They're not taking something from you. This is the wealthiest country on earth. Right. There are enough resources for everyone. It's being kept mm -hmm. from all of us. Mm -hmm. And see, th this is why we got to understand lesser evil politics. I think of it as like a hamster wheel. Because there's motion. You're exerting energy. But you're not making any progress. Right. And, and I think Jalen was sort of speaking to this uh, a moment ago. It's sort of like, it's as if we're expected to vote Democrat ad infinitum, like on into eternity. Mm -hmm. Like how long do we think we can effectively do that? Because even if Kamala Harris wins, Trump's not going to disappear in the thin air. Right. And, and the fascist movement that supports him right. isn't going anywhere. So how long do we think we can stave off that uh, with any real effectiveness? At a certain point, we have to break from that and build something independent of the ruling class duopoly that's going to actually fight for our needs. Because do, do y'all ever notice that when it comes to making demands of this government, it's never the right time. Right. <laughs> it's always like, oh, yeah, that, that sounds good, but I don't know, maybe next election. Y'all work on it and maybe it's always next time, next time, next time, and next time never comes. And that's rooted in that fear that Rachel was just talking about. That's what American politics are based on, yep. coercion and fear. Mm -hmm. Because if it weren't for that, then you'd actually would have to give people the things that they're saying they need. Right. But instead, there's always this ready-made excuse. It's like, well, you know, it would be nice if I made enough money to live on or if I had health insurance <laughs> or if I had a little time to, uh, you know, spend with, with my family. Every time you bring up basic things that you need, it's like, oh, well, you must want Trump to win. That's what Kamala said when, when those two Arab women were, were protesting her rally and uh, talking about a ceasefire and an arms em embargo. You know, she, she shouted them down. She said, I'm speaking. You know what I mean? If you want Trump to win, just say that. You know, she practiced that in the mirror a thousand times. Right. Right. So saying that if you want me to end the genocide on your people, that is equivalent to you wanting a Donald Trump presidency. You cannot ask anything of me. We do have to talk about it from a psychological perspective also. The the factor of power uh, injects these people with this idea that they actually don't have to, to serve anyone except for themselves. And to serve themselves is to serve empire, to serve profit. I think the point about uh, next time is important too, right? Because that's the cycle, right? On the hamster wheel. Next time is a book that is never going to be written. It's like next time by the Democratic Party coming 
two thousand whenever, yeah. right? Two thousand never. It's like this is a book that is not going to be written. This is going to be something that they avoid constantly because it detracts from their plan, right? The duopoly of the Democratic and Republican Party is is a really, really important point, too, because it's like uh, they are two different facets of the same system that are looking for unipolar control over us. I, I think that that's something that we have to say, too. So I think that to both of these points, it's like, wherein do we effectively um, change what it looks like to orient to that, right? Like, to your point, the mass movements, um, to your point, um, uniting diaspora issues, right? Um, because we have more in common than we do with people who are are greedy, right? That's just as simple as that. And I think that when I when I'm hearing this conversation, it's just like there's so many things that are happening on a time scale to respond to them in a half ass way from the Democratic Party, right? Um, to your point of the democratic influencers on the internet um, dividing through videos of being like all the people, all the organizers, all the all the people who are, are rising up in the streets who are talking about Palestine don't care about Haiti. They don't care about the Congo, right? This is the main the main like pivot and, and precedent for the divide and conquer, right? It's that we want to use someone that looks like you to tell you that you don't care about you, that you don't care about people that look like you, that you don't care about your larger diaspora, whether that's Haitians, whether that's West Africans, whether that's um, people in the Congo. Um, I think that it's a really lame excuse. Like when you actually are involved in our movements, when you actually are organizing, you see the intense internationalism and you see the intense solidarity. There are Palestinian comrades who... I organize with, who you organize with every day, who know at the center of their struggle is everyone else's struggle, who knows that what is happening with Haiti at a result of U.S. imperialism is something that they have to smash. And it's not vibes. It's not something that we're just saying just because it sounds cool, just because it sounds radical, but it's because we have effectively um, come to a point to analyze, like, this is what's happening. This is laid out for us. And it, there comes a point where you have to wake up. And I think to your point, too, like a lot of people who are complaining about Trump have every right to complain, right? Have every single right to complain. Who are complaining about Kamala, but like, I'm still going to vote for her. Have every right to find their logic. But there has to be a point where we also invite them in, right? I, I want to call out to you because I want you to change how you think. It's just a simple matter of fact, because I don't agree with you. And I really agree with how I feel. And I may be able to um, communicate to you wherein there might be fault in your logic. The lesser of two evils is a logic. It's not one that is, it's a backwards logic. It's still a logic, right? It's still like, yeah, well, to some degree, there she might be less evil than Trump, like less sinister. But it's a faulty logic because of everything that we've talked about, the policies, um, her statement saying that she'll, she'll be tougher on border control and saying that she's a, a better police officer. She's a better, a better agent to the empire is what she's exclaiming. And it's like we have to be able to see that because she's saying it outright. Like you're telling me and other people here at this rally that you're going to be tougher on migrants who are leaving their countries because of what? U.S. sanctions. They can't survive in their homelands because the capitalist class, companies, CEOs want to extract resources that make money from these countries to sell it everywhere else, to sell it across NATO, to sell it to other countries at a high price so that they can get richer and keep that money and maybe send some of it to Israel, but keep a lot of that money and hoard it for themselves. Mm -hmm. They want to militar militarize the border. They want to build a cop city in Atlanta. They want to, Eric Adams wants to build a cop city in New York City, in College Point, Queens. Every other governor is going to start talking about cop cities because of this precarious nature of the United States system, right? We don't know what's going to happen. There's so many immigrants. There's so many dangerous people in our countries. There's, you see it every day on Fox News where they say, these, these immigrants beat up this police officer. It happened in New York. These immigrants are stealing from people's houses, wherein the conditions are... are placing people in scenarios where they don't know where to turn. And when you don't know where to turn, when you're hungry, you get desperate. Yeah. And when we're faced with the climate catastrophe, because our government is not doing anything, people are getting hotter in their countries that are already hot. 
They have to leave. They have to migrate. People in Bangladesh are going to be underwater. There's flooding in the streets. So there are all these crises that are unending. And they are at a huge part of our political parties and our system in the United States. They are, again, facilitated. So I think that we do have to think about how we, how we organize, how we build the power that shifts that. And I think that when we're thinking about our communities is that we do have to invite people in. We do have to exercise this, this right to knowledge, this right to access, and, and really tell people, like, all these things that are connected, they may feel like you can't do anything about it, but you can. Mm -hmm. Your voice, your, your creative talent, uh, your, your swagger, your confidence, whatever it may be, you could, you could just be someone who's charismatic. And if you understand, like, this government isn't serving me. The way that you can say that to somebody else, like, let me ask you something, is really, really important because it comes down to this human level of, like, how we relate to one another. And I think that when we're talking here about other options, of course, we're going to talk about Claudia and Karina. And we're going to talk about what it means for two people who are not um, a Democrat or Republic, but our other options are what people desire, right. right? I need a different option because what I'm looking at are two rotten apples, right? Mm -hmm. One may be a little bit less rotten, but it's still a rotten apple. And sure, that logic exists. But if we look a little bit to the left, where the camera is important, there's a wealth of fruit. There's a wealth of, of, of food. There's an abundance, right? So it's just like we have to a lot to people that this logic is faulty um, and that they aren't as powerful as they make themselves out to believe, right? Yeah. Yeah, and what's important to say, because you mentioned cop cities. Yeah. The reason why we're seeing the proliferation of cop cities and the reason why we're seeing these, quote unquote, critical infrastructure uh, policies in, in response to uh, uh, climate action demonstrations is the ruling class is very aware of increasing militancy and, or and organization around these issues. So they're developing these reified institutions of repression mm -hmm. and surveillance, you see. And so then the organizing aspect that we've been talking about becomes uh, that much more important, critical, actually. And this is why I'm glad you raise uh, the campaign for Claudia De La Cruz and Karina Garcia for the Party for Socialism and Liberation, Jalen, because there are so many aspects of their platform that speak not only to black people specifically, but to the needs of poor, working and oppressed people in this country in general. So it's like if we talk about, you know, ending the war on black America. OK, what does that entail? Ending police terror. All right. Jailing killer cops should be the rule and not the exception. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, we know that affirmative action programs have been shredded in this country, but they should be expanded. Mm -hmm. And I'd be remiss, of course, if I didn't mention reparations. Right. Cut the check. Cut the check. America has Wait. to cut the check. Sure. You feel what I mean? And also uh, cutting the, the, the war budget. Right. You see what I mean? You know, the United States, what was it? The National Priorities Project came out with a report that said, in 2023, uh, the United States spent more on its military than the next nine governments combined. $12 trillion. Including, this includes China, Russia, uh, Japan, France, Germany, Saudi Arabia, and a few others. Wow. So all the money that we are not getting, despite our desperate need, again, is going to uphold this global war machine. It's going to uh, uh, facilitate the 700 some odd military bases and installations. It's going to these wars. It's going to genocide. You see what I mean? This is the material connection between the ravages of imperialism and the war on the masses of people here in this country. So I think, you know, these are just a couple of aspects of uh, uh, Claudia and Karina's platform that I think really speaks to these issues. And what are some of the aspects that you see, Rachel? One of the most damaging things that I think 
about this system is the fact that it destroys our collective imagination as a people to envision a better and brighter future. I mean, all of our struggles are struggles, right? Where we're, we're, we're being defensive almost. We're fighting against these ravages of the system. But I think it's time that we think about what we're fighting for, you know, what we're building to construct, a socialist reconstruction, if you will, and thinking about what a society could look like if power was in the hands of the working class people, you know, rather than these billionaires who are corporate sponsored, who get their checks from APAC or whatever it might be uh, in order to make policies that don't suit us. It's time that we actually take the wealth of this of this country, the most the wealthiest country in the history of the world. We can't forget that the history of the world and use it for collective good. I mean, there's no reason that people should be on the streets without a bed to sleep in, that people are digging in trash cans for their next meal, that people have to take their kids to work with them because they can't afford daycare. All of these things are crises, you know, and to the the ruling class, the people in power, those are crises because those aren't issues that they ever have to deal with or have to confront. Meanwhile, our people are confronting them on the day-to-day -day basis, you know, figuring out just how to get by. And so one of the most exciting things of uh, uh, pillars of the Claudia and Karina platform is the fact that we're going to seize these top 100 corporations and use that those hundreds of mil billions, trillions, I don't even know, I can't even fathom how much money it would be, right? And I'm sure neither of you can either because we've never seen that type of money. But seize these top 100 corporations and use that money, the money that we have created as the working class because that money was made on our backs, right? It wasn't made on those CEOs' backs that are rolling in dough and on their yachts and on their vacation homes or whatever in the tropics. But use that money for the collective wealth of our society. You know, there's so many jobs in our society that are pointless, that are straight up pointless. No shade, I mean, we're just working to survive, but it's like, why do we have a whole finance industry? Why do we have all these industries where people are literally just click clacking away on their, la on their, <laughs> on their keyboards? And, we don't actually know the bigger picture of the workplace that we're working for. You know, we're just doing some tiny little thing. We could have jobs that actually contribute to the construction of a new society. We can have we can play a part in the world that we want to build and that we are fighting for to see rather than always being so defensive about, you know, the struggles that we are facing real time in our communities. I think it's time that we see ourselves as worthy as deserving of that, you know, because we can't continue to say, oh, next time, oh, next time. Now is the time. Come on. Now is the time. And see, this is really my favorite part of Claudia and Karina's campaign, is that it is not restricted to what happens in November. Right. We are building a movement before and after the election because we are clear that that is what it's going to take for the masses of poor, working, and oppressed people to get the things that we need. Mm -hmm. And to have the understanding that to cast a vote for this or that ruling class figure, whether it's a Democrat or a Republican, whether they're wearing a red tie or a blue tie, them winning the seat does not constitute a victory for us. And I'm reminded of a quote, I think it was from uh, uh, Eugene Debs, who was a socialist that ran for president. Mm -hmm. and he said, I'd rather vote for something I want and not get it mm -hmm. than to vote for something I don't want and get it. Right. And so this, this is the consciousness that we have to have when we talk about how socialists intervene in elections. Well, Jalen, Rachel, as we draw to a close here, I'm reminded of something that Malcolm X said, that uh, history is best equipped to reward our research. Mm -hmm. So when we think about history, how is it that black people have achieved anything that we've achieved? How is it that poor working and oppressed people 
have achieved anything that they've achieved. It's through being organized and by building movements. And this is true of all the people that we admire in history. Fannie Lou Hamer in an organization. Asada Shakur in an organization, a revolutionary party, in fact. Claudia Jones, Ella Baker, Paul Robeson. All of these giants on whose shoulders we stand understood the same thing, that there is no liberation without organization. And this is precisely what we'll have to remember as we enter this next period.